And one of the things that intrigued me about you is that you are a computer scientist as well as a neuroscientist, and that's like the sweet spot for the community that's watching this YouTube channel. Uh -huh. It's an inter interesting uh, juxtaposition of neuroscience, would you say, is a very, could, uh, can be a very long lead time where you actually see some results out in the world, right. versus computer science, which you can turn around very quickly. Oh, exactly. Um, and, and on the neuroscience side, I mean, so I eventually then, while I was at Salesforce um, and kind of running the, the machine learning team there, I went to Cosign. Um, the big computational neuroscience conference mm -hmm. in 2013, and I think I did that all entirely for fun. Yeah, well, I was yeah. like, you know, it's in Utah. I, it's in Salt Lake City every year. I have like a really good friend from undergrad. Well, you're curious. You want to know what's going on? Uh, exactly. And you know, Cosine's this nice kind of small conference, and so, and also like, right at the at the end of 2012, the Obama administration had announced their. Um, brain initiative, right, where they right, were yeah. record from large amounts of, of neural data. You know, I was starting off graduate school, everyone was like, don't work on techniques for neuroscience. It's like, it's a dead end, you know, no one gets jobs that way, technology is all very mature. But with the rise of optical microscopy as an acquisition modality, right, so the idea that you could actually change the neurons such that you could then just look at them uh -huh. and see their activity. Um, and the development of, of, of optogenetics techniques where you can kind of, um, again, you genetically change the neurons such that they, you can then control them with lasers. Mm -hmm. um, this was, it, these things were becoming very hot again. And there's this whole field of connectomics where people are increasingly trying to, at a single cell level, trace out these circuits, right? Yeah. They're generating all of this incredible graph data and no one really knows right now yet what to do with that, right? It's just, it's yeah. so new. And it was a really an opportunity to get down on the ground floor. Well, we're already touching on some of the topics I wanted to talk to you oh, about awesome. today. Great. So uh, but without any further ado, let's get on with the program, which is Interview with a Neuroscientist. I'd just like to welcome Dr. Eric Jonas. He is uh, here at uh, Berkeley at EECS. He's a postdoc. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. So uh, let's get on with it then. Uh, I've got four different uh, neuroscience topics in, in here with your name on it, and I'm going to show them to you, and uh, we'll talk over them. And uh, I'll let you pick which one you want to talk to. So first of all, well, the first one is it's not a tumor; it's a lesion. You can guess that maybe about lesions. <laughs> great. Um, uh, transistors, registers, and neurons. Oh my. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, the third one is connectome the dots. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and brain data overload. These are great. Okay. These are awesome. Yeah, so, All right, so let's start with the connectome one. Let's yeah. do. There we go. Connectome the dots. And I have a few. Yeah, I'll, I'll just let you start. If you want to describe oh. what a connectome is, I have some specific questions. But great. Uh, Neuroscience is interesting because these systems um, compute, mm -hmm. right? Like lots of, lots of, the liver is also this incredible organ inside the body with, with thousands of different enzymes and it breaks down literally almost anything you throw at it and the way those interact are incredibly complicated. The brain is actually doing all of this computation. And the brain appears to be an organ where, in some sense, um, all those different parts at the cellular level are actually doing very distinct things, as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. But historically, you know, because the brain is so complicated, I mean, there are, there are 80 billion cells in your brain that are wired up to each other with, you know, let's say a trillion different interconnections. So it's this massive kind of circuit, right? This massive roadmap. And historically, the only tools that we've had to ask questions about how this system works have involved kind of looking at it from a... a uh, a very large scale perspective. The only organism for which we have its full neural connectome is this tiny uh, uh, little worm called C. elegans. Yes, the famous C. elegans. Exactly, and this was devised in 1986 because uh, by very hardworking graduate students, um, looking at you know microscope sections of this of this worm, and it's it, it only has 302 neurons. Right, so it basically can go forward, backwards, left, right. It's this incredibly simple model organism, mm -hmm. um, and that's basically the only connectome we have. Um, and <laughs> not much to go on. Not much to go on. Well, especially because you know those sorts of organisms, um, the way their neurons work is actually much simpler than the way like mammalian neurons work. So. Sure. Um, there, there was this real interest in trying to do kind of high throughput measurements um, 
of larger numbers of neurons simultaneously and figuring out how they're all connected, figuring out what those circuits are. And so there's been this connector and push um, over the past, let's say, uh, 10 to 15 years where, where scientists really want to get at that data. Right? They want to understand. Is the push because of advances in technology making it accessible? I think I think that the, right, the underlying technological improvements have, have been pretty substantial, especially, you know, we've had for a long time the ability to take you know, take a, a section of a mouse brain, chop it up really thin, and look at it under an electron microscope, right? Neurons are Yeah, but so, it's frozen in time at that point. So right? it's very much frozen in time, and it's also like um, the ability to do anything with that data also has been a real challenge historically. And one of the things we focus on in, in our theory or the, the structure of the neocortex and the cortical columns of, and the different layers in the columns, it, it, can, can you define connectomes at that level? Of... So you can. I mean, so in fact, you know, one of the holy grails for all of this connectomics work is we'd like to get a couple of cortical columns, mm -hmm. right? And we'd like to do, so the, 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 the cortex, the kind of outer part of the brain is, is organized um, as if it has a bunch of tiny little modules called cortical columns, and each of those contains a fairly large number of neurons. And it's kind of weird because we know that all different parts of cortex do different things, right? There's auditory cortex and visual cortex, and there's there's cortex that, that, that just is object detection. There's prefrontal cortex, which we think is responsible for kind of higher order processes. Mm -hmm. um, but it all has this column structure. And so the, the Allen Institute in particular is hoping that they're going to get a couple of cortical columns out of visual cortex, which would be super cool. But yeah, people... Can explain things in the auditory cortex. So, so the, the hope is, yeah, that it kind of generalizes in, in right. this interesting way. And, um, but like, remember the, the connectomics we're talking about right now is trying to understand how every cell is connected. There are other approaches, um, including like that the, the Allen Institute works on, where instead they try and understand how, for example, at the cortical column level, how these are all interconnected. Right, right. Um, Not necessarily the neuron to neuron level, but how the column behaves. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And how the column is connected to other areas. So right. it's a... It's potentially incredibly exciting data, yeah. Um, but it's still, um, and I think it's 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 accessible now as opposed to being say ten or fifteen years ago because the data volumes that are being generated just in terms of the raw imaging data are are only things that we can kind of manage as of recently, right? Because of machine learning, because of machine learning, because of computation, exactly, right. So this would be a good time to go to the next card, which is uh, on the same topic as your paper that you just mentioned, uh, Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? Because I thought it was intriguing how you equated a neuron to, like, what what component in the computer might you equate a neuron to, a transistor or a set of transistors? Uh... I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Um, so neuroscientists, I mean, you can imagine, you study, we study the brain at a bunch of different levels, right? Right. Um, you know, some, some neuroscientists are very interested in kind of the chemical mechanisms by which neurons communicate with one another, right? right. Other neuroscientists are interested in kind of how the whole brain um, reaches various types mm -hmm. of decisions. Or else there's a whole field of oscillatory dynamics, which seems to get, be very Right, and so some people are interested in how different regions of the brain communicate with each other. Yeah. And, and it's very, it's always fun because in neuroscientists, you basically, um, there's this real culture of everyone who studies things at a lower level than me is just chasing meaningless details. <laughs> I can see that. And everyone who's studying stuff above me is is just, you know... Lofty uh, ideas. Lofty <laughs> ideas. None of that. No one really knows how any of that works, and they're all full of it. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, my I was I was kind of trained as a... A, a lot of my training was at, at kind of the systems neuroscience level. So I think generally think of things in terms of neural circuits and the computation that neural circuits are doing. Right. Um, and you're also an electrical and engineer. You're also an electrical scientist. engineer. No, exactly. So I also have formal, you know, I grew up as like when I was eight, I was like building circuits in my garage, right? So it's a very, yeah. um, in fact, there's a, there's something very kind of um, aesthetically pleasing, I think, about this idea that, you know, um, we have small modules and we, we glue them together, we wire them together to do better things, right? All of engineering is kind of based on this idea that, you know, I have small blocks and I can put them together to, to create functions, these kind of notions of abstraction and composition. Mm -hmm. and, and this goes through all of engineering and kind of all of computer science. Um, and, and we look for that in the brain, right? We think that, well, look, different modules in the brain presumably do different things. And maybe different neurons or different types of neurons in the brain are doing different things. We don't really understand how even basic neural systems work, right? We have lots of theories and we say we can describe lots of kind of phenomena. Yeah. Um, 
but we do understand how a microprocessor works, right? right. And and even an, we even, can't say there's a there's an atomic module yet in the brain, but uh, right, exactly. We know that we know that certain parts of the brain, if you remove them, you lose certain types of function, but it's mm -hmm. not clear why, and is that really the right the right way to be thinking about this? And so we know that um, whereas. The what's what I think is interesting in in the microprocessor case is that you know everyone who has a computer science or computer architecture degree understands how that processor works all the way from the individual transistor mm -hmm. right from the individual uh, uh, logic element all the way up to the algorithms and the operating yeah, systems yeah. and all of this and in fact it's beautiful you can teach you know an undergrad basically covers this material in like the first year and a half or something yeah. right. And, and then and, most of it you never have to come back to. No, and then, you know, yeah, exactly. And then, then you use your JavaScript game engine and you're fine. Um, but whereas I'm like, no, I love that like lower level stuff and I love kind of going between the layers. But mm -hmm. um, the, the nice thing about the microprocessor is that lets you kind of sidestep all of these philosophical questions about what is understanding, mm. right? What would it mean to really understand a neural system? We don't really know. Is it having the algorithms? Is it understanding the circuitry? People argue and debate these things and have been for, you know, literally like 80 years. Mm -hmm. With a microprocessor, you can just, we have such a good gut instinct, right? We kind of know understanding when we see it there. And so when we apply our kind of common algorithms that we use in neuroscience to the system, right? We can ask this question, well, is the insight that it looks like it's providing you know, does it match up with what I think understanding really is in the right, system? Right. And the question you asked of kind of what is the neuron equivalent in a microprocessor, I think is actually like the one of the most interesting questions that, that we should be asking ourselves right now, because, you know, um, as a systems neuroscientist, you treat a neuron as kind of a box. It has some inputs, it has some outputs. Yeah. Um, if you're a, a, and that's kind of, you know, the universe I came from, and I can imagine treating kind of a transistor or maybe a digital logic gate like that, right? Yeah. But if you do, if you go one layer deeper, a neuron is not just a simple thing, mm -hmm. right? A neuron is one of the most complicated cells in all of existence. It has... Um, all this interesting physical structure. It has like a, a base within like a, a cell body or a soma, which has all this interesting kind of chemistry going on inside it. And then it has its outputs that come out via this axon. Lots it's, of IO. Right, exactly. It has IO. all these inputs and these, these dendrites. And, and, and there they're getting all these connections and they're inside each individual synapse. It's mm -hmm. like there's a little computer running that's yeah, performing yeah. various All contributing to the neuron's function and whether it's going to fire or now. Exactly. Or now. And so I think that, that, that the, I mean, one way, of, one way I explain it is that the actual processor we looked at, the 6502, could not simulate, could not do a good job of simulating a single neuron. Really? <laughs> yeah. So if you actually want to do like a biophysical wow. model, like a multi-compartmental model of a single neuron, like that, that processor is really going to struggle. Wow. Right? So, so the, the level of complexity in individual neurons is just so incredibly fast. It's, it's understanding how these sorts of systems work. I mean, the, the thing that was interesting for me is that none of our existing machine learning or AI technologies do a good job of figuring out how the microprocessor works. And this is like a, a it's a 40 year old system. It's, as I said, it's much simpler than really even a single neuron. Yeah. And yet we can't extract kind of me, what we would consider to be meaningful insight about the underlying computation from observing all of that data, right? We looked mm -hmm. at every transistor over long periods of time, and we don't have the kind of comparative technology to do that in neuroscience today. Yeah, so the cliff notes for that paper is no, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you're wondering. All right, one, one more uh, card here. It's not a tumor, it's a lesion. And this is again from the same paper we, we've just been talking about, because there was a section in there about sort of simulating lesions in the microprocessor in different places. Maybe you can talk about why lesions are important in neuroscience research and why you tried to do that in Great. your experiment. So you could imagine if, um, if you were trying to understand how your car works, right? What does your car do? Well, you drive forward, you drive backwards, you drive to the store. One way you might try and understand how your car works if you didn't know anything and let's say you had a lot of cars sitting around as well, you might try removing some part right. and seeing if the car still worked. And so, you know, if you remove the windshield wipers, the car will still work. Maybe it won't quite as well in the rain, but it will still work. Um, whereas if, if you remove the steering wheel, the car will still kind of work. You can go <laughs> forward and backwards, but so you'll see that there's kind of this, this deficit of functionality, right? Yeah. If you remove the brakes, you can't stop, but yeah. if you remove the wheels, it won't go anywhere. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, people in neuroscience have been, have been running kind of similar experiments for, for the past kind of 50 to 80 years where, you know, we don't necessarily know how all the different parts of say a mouse brain work, but we know that if we, if we remove a certain part of the mouse brain, like it loses its ability to turn left or it loses its ability to uh, figure out how to get out of a certain type of maze. Sure. And what that starts telling us is that those parts 
are potentially important for figuring out or for, for that function. Uh, if you remove the radiator and you discover that you can only drive your car for you know a, a quarter of a mile before it, it breaks, um, that doesn't necessarily tell you what the radiator was actually doing. Right. And you can imagine saying something like, well, I think the radiator is responsible. Maybe the radiator is like a, an energy storage thing and it's, mm -hmm. it, it stores up the initial energy at the beginning and then kind of lets it go over the course of the drive. And, and maybe that's why if you remove it, the car can only go a little. And of course, this is totally wrong and this is just some mm -hmm. kind of fanciful story you've told yourself. It can raise more questions than you have beforehand. Though. Exactly. Simply knowing that some part is necessary for function doesn't necessarily tell you much about what's actually happening. And so in the processor case, we would do things like remove a particular transistor, right? And then see, could you still play this game? And for some of them, you know, for the three games we looked at, some transistors only impacted a single game. Hmm. And so if you were a neuroscientist, you said, well, that transistor must be intimately involved in kind of the Donkey Kong computations. <laughs> right. And, you know, when you hear that as a computer scientist, you're like, well, that's obviously nuts. But that's effect effectively what we're doing with a lot of neuroscience. And even in this day of, of, of much more advanced techniques like optogenetics, where we don't have to damage the neuron, we can, in fact, turn them on and off programmatically, even still, that level of kind of uh, function removal mm -hmm. or, is a, a very crude tool. Because your brain is actually not really a static structure, right? Your brain um, is kind of continually adapting and learning new things and changing. And in fact, parts of your brain have the ability to kind of take over roles from other parts of your brain, right? So this plasticity leads to things like um, there are people often, you know, you hear these stories where people with various type of brain damage recover functionality. And that's mm -hmm. because your brain actually is kind of shockingly, good. neural systems are shockingly good at um, recovering functionality right, in the face of, of various forms of, of, of damage. Um, and so what happens is um, you can do a lesion study and not see any effect. I can remove part of the brain and be like, oh, this doesn't appear to change anything. But the, what really happened is that there was this kind of uh, co-opting of function. Something else in the brain kind of stepped up to do, to fulfill the role. Yeah. There's no an analog there in the processor. The processor really just does one thing. Yeah. It doesn't have this kind of plasticity. But that also, but in, in neuroscience, this makes it even worse. It makes it much more challenging. Yeah. To understand yeah. what's really going and on. To understand yeah. what's really going on. And so this is partly what kind of all of this has made me kind of actually shift my research focus kind of away from just doing algorithms to understand this data and more towards kind of trying to come up with new ways of getting this sort of data. Right. right? I think that, that, that the only real path forward to understand these really kind of um, complicated systems is figuring out ways of making our measurement tools smarter, mm -hmm. right? Having them help us figure out kind of what the right questions are to ask. And this is one place that kind of uh, um, machine learning technology is getting better and better at doing, right? So yeah. uh, what I'd like to be able to do is say kind of, here's my hypothesis space. What are the right set of experiments for me to run? And in fact, can I then run them in an automated fashion mm -hmm. to figure out which of these is most likely to be correct? Because this kind of purely observational paradigm where, you know, I have the thing do a bunch of stuff, um, I have the animal execute some task or whatever, I look at the data and then the algorithms try and figure out what's going on, it seems to be really unlikely to bear the kind of fruit that we'd like on the time scales that we care about. So you, you would rather have something where I, you, you mentioned a hypothesis space, like there's a broad range of things that we think might be happening mm -hmm. here. Uh, that, that makes more casting a wide net, I guess. Right, exactly. And, and help me figure out kind of what is the right way of figuring out which of these is most likely to be correct. Right. Right. I mean, the, the, the analog there is that, you know, um, we, the Human Genome Project was completed in, I think, 2000 or 2001. And we finally had this complete genetic map. And everyone thought this was going to kind of <laughs> radically alter medicine. Yeah. And yet we didn't really see that genomic uh, uh, revolution in, in medicine until kind of much more recently. And that's because I think the technology required, the technology to kind of sequence a genome became so cheap that what you could do is make some changes to the system, right? Mm -hmm. You could genetically, you know, change some property of some cells, right? And then let them do their thing and then kind of measure the resulting genetic variation, right? You got to this point where we could, um, this kind of cheap sequencing technology enable us to go from kind of this passive observational model right. to actually this interactive mm -hmm. experimental model. Yeah, you get a and tighter feedback loop. Exactly, and, because yeah. the, in some sense, the space of things that could be happening, kind of the, the set of possible explanations for your data is so large that the only way to really constrain it is by running more experiments right right and and of course this doesn't sound um 
this doesn't sound especially, I think, novel or deep, but we need to remember that, you know, for a long time, we've had articles like saying that, well, you know, big data means that the scientific method is obsolete, right? <laughs> and, you know, we're just going to comb through all of this data. Um, but the reality is, is that no, I think, I think more experiments are necessary. I think better experimental technologies are necessary. And I think kind of using AI and machine learning to guide that is yeah. kind of the only way forward. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Well, Dr. Jonas, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's always nice to come to the beautiful Berkeley campus. Uh, um, and thanks, everybody, for watching this interview with uh, Eric Jonas, and hopefully you'll join us for the next interview.